the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. I think I can begin. Now, um, this is, as you know, the third in a series of five lectures with dealing with philosophy of values, or philosophies of value. And um, the particular one for tonight, the relationship between art and morality, or art and morals, is uh, probably uh, the most difficult, I think, because it's the least relevant, it seems to me, to what is explicitly going on in terms of social morality. Uh, if we think back uh, to the first lecture on ultimate value in history, for those of you who are here, whatever be the philosophical merits of the issue, whether to what extent values can be discovered in uh, tracing the historical process, whether by a theology which tries to see what would be the end of history, as, that is to say, eschatological theology, a theology which tries to see what historical purpose would be, or whether by a secularization of the historical process so that historical justice and historical right become meaningful terms. One can speak not of what is right or wrong, what is right or wrong historically, or what, not of what is just or unjust, but of historical justice. Whatever be the merits of that issue abstractly, it, is there, it simply is the case that in one whole segment of theology for centuries, the belief in uh, a sort of theology of history motivated social action and much more poignantly for us in the last 150 years the uh, explicit value theory of uh, a committed social movement of a revolutionary social movement uh, the Marxist movement has, has of course been committed to a theory which argues that values can be discovered through an examination of the process of history and a projection of its future in that sense, whatever be the abstract merits of a discussion on the philosophy of history, the direct relationship to what is going on in the world is clear. And the uh, failure or success or aborted failure or corruption of Marxism is co connected intimately with the failure or success of an attempt to think through a theory of values which argues that values can be discovered through an analysis of the nature of history. Similarly, uh, last week, the question of the relationship between institutionalized religion or religious faith and values is, of course, a dramatic question. Uh, whatever be the vitality of religion in our day, whatever be its um, uh, the very opposite of vitality, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, if you're not vital, what are you? Uh, decrepit, what word? Weakness? No, I don't know whether that's the opposite of vitality. Rigidity, perhaps. I don't know. Sterility? Um, senescence? I'm not sure. Impotence? Whatever be the status of religion, whichever word you choose that's not vital, there can be no question that whether simply as a rigid stratification or whether as a pulsing vitality, a tremendous proportion of the value systems of people living is directed to religion. If religious faith is an illusion, then the value systems are based upon an illusion. If religious faith is a vital uh, uh, truth, then these value systems are based upon a vital truth. Indeed, after the class with uh, a, um, a teacher of sociology uh, talking about Nazism, and uh, this person who's here tonight said, well, you know, uh, Nazism was a post-Christian philosophy. In that sense, I think I'm not distorting what you said. In that sense, it's true that given a religious uh, community, um, uh, Nazi culture could not have arisen. Whatever be the vitality of religion in that sense, it simply was a block for alternative value systems, in this case, the, the value system of Nazism. But I mention this in passing, and I think that I mention that as to say the reference both to the vitality or the uh, harm that Marxism has done as a system of values. I mention it both in connection with the vitality or the stratification that uh, religious systems and religious faith have given to our values in current times. 
Whatever be the case in those two, and I certainly believe that in next week and the week after, that is to say, the whole question of the relationship of science to values is of direct relationship to what's going on, and the concluding attempt to see how one would justify philosophy of values, and indeed the failure in philosophy to justify values in the 20th century, has been crucially relevant to the value systems of people. But I think the whole question of art and morality falls much more into a void, simply because uh, uh, although there are philosophies of art, artists don't pay much attention to them, and uh, although there are moral systems, people do not feel that artistic activity is going to be the coping stone or the most significant feature for an interpretation of the moral life. I think that is to say that, putting it very bluntly, one can look to sort of um, major movements that express philosophical values in history, Marxism, communism, whatever you want. One can look to major movements, all the institutionalized religion, that argue for philosophical values in terms of, or for values, ultimate values, in terms of religion. One can certainly look at major movements in thought that have argued for ultimate value terms in terms of science, indeed, the most pervasive thought of America in America, prag- pragmatic movement, has argued for value judgments in terms of science. And one can certainly see how the influence or the impotence of philosophy to give direction on value questions has been crucial in the 20th century, even for the rise of nihilism, perhaps for the rise of relativism, perhaps for tolerance, for a variety of things. But the relationship of art to values is a much more vague and nebulous subject. And this is disturbing because, of course, there are few areas where one would look more positively for a source of ultimate values than artistic experience and artistic activity, and few areas where it would seem that the moral life could be more enhanced than in terms of uh, artistic expression. I think, of course, partly this is just in the essence of of, uh, conflict between art and aesthetics. There's a famous story, which is true, a uh, number of artists being asked to write their, um, their um, philosophies of art or philosophies of value. And uh, when it came p- to Picasso who was asked, he decorated the letters of the alphabet. And this was a very appropriate sort of answer. These are words for him, and uh, the letters of the alphabet and decoration is all he can offer you if you ask him for a statement. Uh, his statement, of course, uh, is expressed through his artwork, and there's no philosophy in the sense of other than the experience of the work of art which he wishes to point to. Um, And this is true, of course, of a committed social artist like Picasso. Uh, The old joke that poetry is what you have left, uh, what what can't be translated in the translation, which means, of course, that it can't be translated into the explicit value statements, suggests the difficulties that we have here. Well, let me... um, Uh, do two different things tonight in trying to face up to these difficulties uh, uh, unsuccessfully. Um, The first is to review the situation historically and uh, because of the auspices and because of the intrinsic interest, I think, uh, particularly from the point of view of of the uh, 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 Jewish sources and actually the clash of the Jewish sources with secular sources, And the second is just to review the issue logically without stating too much. I'm very apologetic. I made the apology in terms of a promissory note for the uh, next two, so I don't feel too bad about being this apologetic. It isn't uh, that I'm uh, uh, playing a sort of false humility. It's that I think that this uh, apology reflects the relationship between art and values in our time. Uh, the inability to make a value theory cohere with artistic experience and vice versa. Let me, as I say, first do the historical section. Um, The history of this topic, relationship between art and morals, is of course a very, very old one, both in Hebraic and Greek sources. Indeed, uh, the first sort of uh, modern literary critic, in some sense modern liberal critic, I think, within the Anglo-American tradition, was Matthew Arnold, and one of his famous essays was precisely this, Hebraism and Hellenism, where he saw Hebraism as the spirit of morality, Hellenism as sweetness and light, the spirit of art, and then 
he saw the difficulty of fusing the two for Western culture being the great problem of the 19th and 20th century. He wrote this uh, about the time he wrote Dover Beach. I don't know the exact date, about 1850. And in the hallmark of Victorian culture, its technological success, the problem of fusing morality with aesthetics, a fusing sense of righteousness with appropriate uh, artistic form seemed to him the central problem of the culture. The interesting question, of course, is the dichotomy. Hebraism is the spirit of justice, righteousness, truth. Hellenism is sweetness and light, the spirit of art, of philosophical truth, of truth in a sense which is not related to morality. Does that dichotomy hold? I think Partly yes, even though it's a cliché. Of course, partly no. And Arnold would have been the first to admit this. But it's an old, old cliché. Indeed, I don't know how, as some of you I know are familiar with the uh, 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 poetry of Judah Levy, who, writing a polemic for religion against rationalism in the medieval uh, period, himself in poetry said, Malacha etzel chokhmat yavan she'en la prikim prachim. What does Hebraism, that is the Jewish spirit, want to the wisdom of Greece that has no fruit but only flowers, where the fruit here means pragmatic morality and the flowers, of course, means aesthetic elegance. And since he wrote his own poems in Arabic and studied Greek thought, his own uh, mind was, of course, split on the fruit and the flowers. But the interesting point is the recognition and acceptance of the dichotomy. It goes back, of course, to the um, belief that Hebraism was anti-aesthetic. And there are, I suppose, two great sources, anti-artistic, Two great sources for this, uh, uh, for this belief, with a certain merit, I think, in both. The first is, of course, the biblical source, particularly in the prophetic tradition, but beginning with the Mosaic tradition, and with the commandment against graven images. And the assumption, the commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and the disavowal of the graven images, with that whole hostility which the prophets waged against the aesthetic elements of Philistine or Canaanite culture, the worship of the golden calf, which was, after all, expressed in um, uh, so many plastic ways, the worship of the various uh, uh, images, the uh, Asherot, which, of course, was the uh, uh, feminine deity, which, of course, is Astarte, which is Venus, in a certain sense, later on, in certain cases, Aphrodite, the very recognition that this is a worship of an image which expresses certain uh, uh, notions of beauty, the whole question of idol worship as being, of course, obviously worship of beautiful form embodied in this world, and the hostility to idol worship with the hostility to graven image being hostility against art. And of course, this is a tradition. The commandment itself allows for any number of interpretations. There's no question that it was more honored in the abuse than in the use in biblical period. After all, right after the Ten Commandments, which offer against graven images, there is, there's a description of the, um, of the Ark of the Law on which there are two cherubim and the description of the wings of the cherubim, uh, the wings of these angels, and it's quite obvious that these were, in our term, graven images. And of course, if the kingdom of Judea, the weaker and smaller kingdom, obeyed this, we know that throughout the centuries of the kingdom of Israel, from the very description of the prophets, the uh, uh, um, icons or symbols of the deity, including, of course, golden calves and other such symbols, existed in the cities of Israel. And, of course, archaeological uh, investigation simply confirms the vast number of graven, graven images that exist throughout the biblical period. And yet the hostility is there. The recognition that somehow Judaism as a religion offers a morality which transcends resting in the here and now. There's a very famous 17th century poet, uh, Herbert, metaphysical poet, about worshiping, about the danger of worshiping nature and not God in nature. And the whole point, I take it, is the recognition that the artist, in some sense, is involved in worshiping the natural or the symbolic, but at any rate, the symbol itself or the natural and never the transcendent um, expression, which is neither the symbol itself nor uh, the natural. The whole conception, you can't see God face to face, you can't make the image of him, the whole conception which lends a certain abstractness to religious deity and in Judaism which lends a certain intensity to morality worked against the aesthetic motif. I think this is true. 
uh, I've made two points there. It's first the transcendent character of the religion, the belief that you cannot find symbols which are expressive of the religious truth. And it's secondly, it's secondly the moral emphasis, the emphasis upon the vanity of symbols or of aesthetic worship or of buildings as opposed to moral truth, both of which, it seems to me, worked against the aesthetic motif, at least in theory. In practice, it's very, very difficult to get a coherent picture because we're so overwhelmed by the theory. The second great source of anti-artistic thought in Judaism is, of course, rabbinic. Here were the victims, of course, of a great uh, historical uh, uh, mistake. Most of the books, for example, which describe uh, the interpretation that the rabbis gave of the um, uh, commandment, thou shalt not make no, have a graven image, thou shalt not make any graven image, suggest that this means there could be no representational paintings in Judaism. And this is, in one sense, true. Obviously, Orthodox Jews to this day will not let photographs be taken and so on. And yet, and yet, the Palestinian Talmud, which was operative, and the Talmudic interpretations which were operative during the heyday of Talmudic period, did not follow this line. As always in Talmudic Judaism, there are several opinions, a school of Hillel, a school of Shammai, minority opinion, majority opinion. And one of the things which was very ironic was why if the Talmudic sources were so anti-figurative decoration, was there so much of it in the old synagogues and so on? The discovery, for example, of this uh, synagogue in Dure Ropas with the uh, beautiful uh, fresco paintings. How does, this, how, does this, how does this come? How does this come to be if rabbinic Judaism is so anti-art? Uh, another illustration, famous illustration of... Uh, Robin Yochan and Menzakai going to the Roman baths and the statue of Aphrodite is there and they say you can't come here it's the statue of Aphrodite and he answers oh well I didn't come to her she came to me and if the Romans don't treat her as a god and build a bathhouse in front of her why should I treat her as a god and there's no question of the syncretism and the use of Roman statues and Roman art throughout uh, uh, Jewish homes at this period throughout Jewish decoration and so on I'm going to give a very dramatic illustration which has uh, lots more overtones in a moment. But the answer to this question was discovered in 1934, 35, perhaps 36, but in the mid-30s, when the uh, uh, professor of Talmud at the Hebrew University, uh, uh, Rabbi Epstein, Professor Epstein, went to Leningrad and saw uh, some manuscripts of the Jerusalem Talmud, which were there, but which had uh, been discovered from late, and had no continuous history had found an interpretation of a rabbi, Abun, which argued that graven images does not apply to figurative paintings. It applies to idols, which means idols, and does not apply to figurative works of art. And it's quite clear that any number of the Jewish community in Palestine must have followed this sort of interpretation rather than the opposite sort of interpretation. That does not mean that there isn't an anti-aesthetic motif. Ethics of the Fathers, which is sort of a handbook of morality, has that very, very famous passage uh, uh, which means what? A person who walks and studies and stops his Mishnah, stops his studying to say, how beautiful is this tree, how lovely is this field, has endangered his soul. And this recognition that the aesthetic motif as opposed to this life of study, the life of, of Torah, the life of morality, is a... Uh, is a, is a false path, is an endangering of the soul, is implicit through a great deal of Judaism. As I say, Im, Im, implicit and explicit in the theory, to what extent was it practiced? We always have to recognize the dichotomy between what the texts say and the way life uh, goes on. Um, uh, Dr. Margolius is very troubled, uh, according to Time magazine. I don't know what extent the trouble is real, to what extent it's sort of a mock horror, at the fact that a book of secrets and magic from Gnostic Judaism should contain formula on how to have a love potion, how to predict a horse race, and so on. But that I really shouldn't be shocked because this is to be expected. Um, and one finds this all the time. I think much more dramatic is the fact that the most beautiful synagogue discovered, the synagogue Dure Europus, has a portrait of David playing the harp, which is a portrait of Orpheus, the Greek god, or Greek, uh, what should one say, Greek musician, the Orpheus, the opera Orpheus and Eurydice, who plays the harp 
in order to get to uh, the nether life and recover Eurydice from Pluto. And the fact that the picture of David should be a copy of the picture of Orpheus. And of course, this is also in the catacombs, the symbol of Jesus going to the nether life is the same symbol of Orpheus, shows something about the syncretism, something about the mixture of terms, something about the mixture of milieu in Greco-Hebraic and Hebraic Greek culture, which of course makes a mockery of a sharp dichotomy between Hebraism and Hellenism. Let me give two illustrations philosophically to show to what extent when Jews were living in Alexandria with Greeks, naturally their art and their morality were uh, merged with the Greek spirit. Uh, Philo of Alexandria, the uh, really founder of Jewish philosophy, is the best illustration because he suggests that the Bible says the Garden of Eden is the perfect society, and yet Plato has proved that the Republic is the perfect society. How can this be? The Garden of Eden is the perfect society and the Republic isn't. And if Plato's Republic is the perfect society, then the Garden of Eden isn't. Well, the solution is very simple. The Garden of Eden is the Republic, and the Republic is the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. But the Garden of Eden was a specific place. It was watered by four rivers, uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and uh, two others. Um, uh, and what's the, what are the four rivers in the Republic? And the answer is very simple. The Republic has four virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. And the four virtues of the Republic are the four rivers of the Garden of Eden. Because, of course, the Bible is a symbolic book to be interpreted in the Greek spirit. There's even a more striking illustration. Uh, uh, more striking illustration than the four rivers are the uh, four virtues of the Republic. Um, he, uh, he interprets the biblical passage, Terach left Ur to go to Haran. Terach was Abraham's father. And he left Ur to go to Haran. Ur was the city of the stargazers. And he went to Haran, which was a desert city where man presumably meditated with himself. And the word Haran has overtones to the word navel, really. So a question of turning inward. And he says, what is this? This doesn't tell you literally. The Bible is interested in telling you a man moved hundreds of miles. This is a journey of the soul. It's the journey from Ur to Haran. Ur was the city of stargazers. Haran was the place where you turned inward. What does this mean? In Greek thought, we learn about Hoi Fuzoi, the physicists, Thales and Anaximander, who studied the stars in the world. Socrates first turned inward and said, know yourself. Terach is doing the same job that Socrates did, turning from stargazers <coughs> to turning inward. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew name for Socrates is Terach, or the Greek word for Terach is Socrates. And Socrates and Terach, Abram's father, the same man. It then turns out, of course, that the philosophy of monotheism and Plato's thought are identical. And it's this sort of syncretism. David playing the harp is Orpheus playing the harp. This sort of syncretism which reveals itself in so much of Hellenistic Greek culture and which mitigates the sharpness of the anti-aesthetic motif in rabbinic or in prophetic Judaism. But let me, this could, one could go on at great length, at great length in uh, showing how the artistic motif will out e even when it's strictly forbidden and of course it's never strictly forbidden even in uh, in Muslim uh, thought where the uh, uh, impetus against figures was much stronger than in Judaism the result of course was the beautiful abstract uh, art so if one goes to a museum of carpets of the 12th and 13th century one is simply struck by the fact that every little hill town in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco produced real masterpieces of abstract art in rug weaving, precisely because a simple formula had to be repeated over and over again, and no figures were allowed. No figures were allowed. But let me hurry on, because I'm not sure to what extent the historical uh, materials is directly uh, relevant for us, except, I think, in showing the dichotomy and the clash between a uh, point of view or a way of life which stresses transcendent religious morality and transcendent religious being and one which wishes to magnify the expressiveness of the symbol and the possibility of a life of self-expression without a search for an absolute morality. The same conflict, of course, exists in Greek culture, which is why Hebraic culture isn't Hebraic and Greek culture isn't uh, Greek in the uh, dichotomous sense. Because if we want to, of course, think of the greatest thinker of the Greek tradition, it's, of course, Plato. 
And if we want to think of the person who banishes art from the Republic, no art is allowed. Yeah, well, that's an extreme sense. No imitative art is allowed. It, and the poets are banished. It's Plato. Man who is himself a poet. And he banishes art. Why? He banishes music because those modes will lead to excessive passion. He banishes music except for those modes which lead to discipline and except for those modes which can be used with gymnastic training. He banishes artistic painting when it's imitative. A, because it's a counterfeit of reality which confuses people. B, because it excites the passions. And C, because it keeps people involved in doing rather than the life of theory or the life of contemplation. And in that sense, the hostility to art in Plato's thought at any rate is real. And one interpretation of Greek culture suggests that this is because in Greek culture there always was the conflict between the notion of reason as balance, measure, order, in that sense the notion of Apollo or the religion of Apollo, and the notion of unreason as vitality, dynamism, orgiastic expressiveness, and this of course is the spirit of Dionysius. And the struggle within the two and the expression of the two means, on the one hand, repression, order, stability. On the other hand, of course, expression, violence, excess. And actually the philosophical theme, Plato as the son of Apollo in terms of legend, as a godson of Asclepius, the uh, uh, medical, the founder of medicine and therapy and order in that sense, is arguing, of course, for that type of order and repression. And the Republic as ideal society precisely represents that type of ordering of society based upon each person fulfilling his function, based upon a certain repression, based upon a certain organization, based upon a certain rational control of human expression, which Plato sees is in one sense of the word anti-aesthetic. The soldiers will not see the extremes of Greek emotion on war and horror because this would make them more cowardly as soldiers and less disciplined, and so on and so forth. Now, if I'm... This, it seems to me, again, is a, is a topic about which a great deal could be said, and all I derive from it in both cases is the recognition that in certain contexts, uh, our most profound sources, if we think of biblical sources as profound, which they're not in any philosophical sense, but which they are in an, another sense, and our most profound philosophical sources, the writings of Plato or of others, have recognized, have recognized that the road between, or the relationship between the life of reason and the life of justice and the life of art is not necessarily continuous and compatible. That quite the contrary, Plato recognized that if he wanted to achieve a perfect society, he would have to banish the poets even though he was a poet himself. And presumably one of the implications in the rabbinic thought is that if you want to have a community of Torah, a community of people dedicated to the law, you have to banish excessive concern with nature, with art. And it's, of course, this recognition that one cannot have all things which creates dichotomies and values and leads to <coughs> priorities, conflicts, rearrangements of compatibilities. Now, I've given an historical sketch, which is worse than a sketch. It's just certain interesting notes both in Plato, just to point out that the Greek spirit had this conflict, and in uh, Judaism, to point out how the theory was anti-aesthetic, and the practice, of course, corrupted the theory, although the theory wasn't uniformly anti-aesthetic. Now, I want to turn, having used these historical materials, to suggest the possibilities of conflict, of dichotomy, of harmonization, to a very simple thing, which I'll take, I suppose, no more than 20 minutes on, uh, it's four parts, or so five minutes each, and then I'll stop uh, and uh, spend the rest of the time in questions and comment if there are them. Perhaps 25 minutes. Now, the topic as formulated is, is just two cliche words, art and morality, without defining what art is or what morality is, and without bothering to define Let's just say, what could be the relationships between art and morals? Let's just make it a sort of, we fed it to a computer. I think there are always four possibilities, and we can just go through them each. There, what would be the four possibilities, just to see the logic of it is very simple. One possibility would be that art and morals are inevitably contradictory. They conflict each other. 
You may choose the life of art. You may choose the life of morality. There will always be a conflict. Second possibility is, of course, that they're autonomous. They're independent. They're isolated. They have nothing to do with each other. Third possibility is that they are compatible. And then, of course, degrees of compatibility emerge. Total compatibility, well, that would be an interesting one. They mean the same thing in different ways. Or should one say, I'm actually making a fifth possibility in that sense, let me just repeat. The first one is that they're contradictory. The second one is they're totally autonomous. A third one would be that they are compatible and in some sense identical. I dismiss that. The fourth is that art and morality are compatible, but art must in some sense be the servant of morals. And the last, of course, is that art and morality are compatible and that morals must be in some sense the servant of art. I don't wish the listing of possibilities to confuse matters. It's intended just to be simple. They either oppose, or they have nothing to do with each other, or they agree, or they're connected. And if they're connected, art is either the servant of morals, or morals in some sense the servant of art. There are more complex relationships, but these are obviously the most simple and direct ones that one would get, even just taking any two things, what could be the relationship. Let's consider the case for each in turn. Let's consider the case for contradiction, which seems to us at first the most barbaric. To say the life of art is contradictory with the life of morality seems to us to say something which, which has to be wrong. And yet, this is a formula which seems to me perhaps the one which underlay both Plato's thought and biblical thought historically. The recognition that involved in the life of art was a deep conflict with certain types of commitment which led to moral life. Let's consider, for example, the case in our, in our own day. Certainly one whole area of dramatic expressiveness abruptly declares not that it is, it is um, uh, not concerned with morality, but that it believes that morality is somehow a facade, that the organization of life for the achievement of values or ends is impossible, and it's characteristically anti-moral. There's a tradition from Nietzsche that human expressiveness must be anti-morality as we understand morality, the organization of life for certain social goals, organization of life in terms of fairness, organization of life in terms of certain ideal of justice. The expression of art is necessarily not only indifferent to that, but even opposed to that. For, um, for example, one can see it, I think, in the theater of the absurd, where although the claim may be the facade of morality is false, the obvious claim is no moral commitments are tenable in our age, and indeed, beware of any moral commitments at all. And indeed, the leading existentialist philosopher in the French tradition of our day, that's Sartre, says, of course, does he not, in a famous book, which is his closest approach to ethical theory, apart from his Marxism, the book Saint Genet, he calls Genet a saint. Genet is not a homosexual, which of course is irrelevant, but a what? A homosexual who has been a, um, a well, a thief, but a male prostitute was the uh, point, I think. Male prostitute who has been involved with children uh, and corrupted children, a thief, a liar, uh, uh, almost anything you would mention in terms of this. And this is the saint. Why? Because he's expressive of his authenticity in style, expresses authenticity in style, lives in a certain Dionysic element in the sense of the expression of his life. He creates his essence through his existence from moment to moment in affirming his being. Now, the fact that a person who, after all, has just, what, refused the Nobel Prize should declare Saint Genet, Saint Genet, reflect something about the recognition of the conflict between morality and art as expressed in this sort of experience. I don't know how far one would want to press this. Um, there's a recognition, of course, that art has been opposed to certain moralities. That's inevitable and might even be declared morality is always opposed to certain moralities. Prophetic morality is opposed to uh, political morality and so on. But the point here is stronger. The point here is stronger. Um, the point here is that any organization of the human experience for ends or goals is so disruptive of the artistic experience which requires immediacy, spontaneity, expressiveness, that there is an inevitable conflict between art and morality. And Saint-Genet expresses it. 
The American saint, I suppose, of this uh, would probably be Norman Mailer. In so many of his writings, the very recognition that the achievement of artistic experience is at, is at odds with any possibility of a moral system except in the most perverse sense of moral system. The end of his novel, The Deer Park, uh, think of uh, God as sex and sex as time and time as the opening of new circuits suggests, of course, um, perhaps an alternative morality, but I think he's suggesting much more openness to experience and therefore the end of morality in the sense of rules of justice or fairness is a necessary condition for artistic creativity and artistic experience. Uh, one could go on in this, um, in this vein, um, uh, 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 trying to study in detail uh, ways in which, particular in the, particularly in what's called the theater of the absurd, particularly in what's called uh, m uh, some of the new wave of, of film, the claim is not just for a different morality, an unmorality, but the claim would be against anything which we would consider moral restraints as, as contradicting the very existence or significance of the possibility of art. Um, I was uh, th trying to think a moment ago of those aesthetic expressions where art must be connected with such a degree of spontaneity, with such a degree, if you will, of nonsense, in the sense of what makes sense literally or rationally, that it must conflict in that sense. It might, of course, be totally removed from, but the usual claim is conflict with any sense of, of morality. I think, of course, the beatnik movement, in a sense, suggests this. Sometimes the claim is it's a different sort of morality. It's sen morality or an offbeat morality as opposed to bourgeois conventional morality. But I think the real point is the claim that art in its essence would be hostile to any sort of moral organization of human experience. Um, in this case, I think this is in some sense a reworking of a very, very old doctrine, the doctrine found in Plato, and as I say, the biblical doctrine as well, which is aware of the tension between art and morality. The doctrine expressed so effectively in Plato, uh, from which begins a whole new uh, modern analysis, which is in line with this, and that analysis is the recognition that the artist is necessarily neurotic, or that there's some connection between art, art, art and madness, or art and sickness. And to that extent, if morality or the organization of experience is connected with health, with what I called a moment ago the Apollonian, with rational control and organization of one's experience, with social mediation of conflicts in a humane way, then to that extent the artistic motif must be hostile to it. And of course one sees this in Baudelaire and in the entire cult of modern art, which has argued that the artist is not just anti-bourgeois, but anti-society in any sense. Um, in this connection, I think the source really is Plato. Uh, there is Greek myth of Philoctetes that art is always born with sickness or with uh, neurosis, and Kafka's written a great deal of this, but in Plato's case, it's that the moral life is always, for Plato, the rational life. That is to say, the life where reason organizes goods. And the artistic life is always, for Plato, the irrational. And yet, art has its own challenge. Consider the following case. This is, of course, Plato contradicts himself. This is true for one part of Plato, not true for all of Plato. But in the Ion and in the Phaedrus, there are the following cases. The case in the Ion is a very interesting dialogue. A man named Ion has won the Panathenian Prize at the Olympic Games for reciting the poetry, I've forgotten whether it's of Homer or of Simonides. And Socrates <coughs> asks him, Tell me something, you have now proved yourself to be the greatest rhapsode, the greatest actor, the greatest dramatic artist in Greece. Are you then a wise man? And he says, of course, I'm one of the wisest. And he then turns to him and says, how is that possible? What are you wise about? And he says, I'm wise in the things of Hober. Let's say it was Hober. He says, well, what does Hober write about? Some of you may very well know, probably know very well this dialogue that I had. What does Hober write about? This is Hober writes about the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. He writes about horses and boats. Are you an expert in horsemanship? Are you an expert in boats? He says, no, I don't know anything at all about it. Well, then, that's a queer sort of wisdom. You're wise in Hober. Hober writes about these things. If I wanted to fight a war, would I go to you? Would I go to a general? By all means, go to a general. Well, then, what's your wisdom? Well, he says, I don't know. 
He says, tell me something. Homer writes about war and boats and horses, and you're the greatest expert in Homer, or the greatest artist in Homer. Simonides writes about these same things, and so does some other person, say Aeschylus. Are you an expert only in Homer or in the others as well? No, I'm an expert only in Homer. He says, well, that's absurd, he says. If they write about the same subject matter and you're an expert in that subject matter, you should be an expert in the other cases. He says, well, uh, you, you're very ignorant in these things. He says, well, you've proved me uh, wrong, Socrates. I'm not a wise man at all. I'm a fool. But all I know is I still won the prize and I'm the greatest artist in Homer. To which Socrates says, of course, that's right. And the truth is that you are a fool in the sense that you are totally mindless, amen, and you're totally lacking in mind. What happens is there's a great magnet, and the magnet of Heracles. And this magnet is a magnet of the muses, which goes by magnetic attraction from the muses to, let's say, Homer, and then from Homer by magnetic attraction to you, and from you by magnetic attraction to your audience. And when you are inspired, you lose your mind, and you begin talking about things about which you know nothing, which artists always do, like uh, war and battles and so on. And in your mindlessness, you are connected with the magnet of the muses, the magnet of the gods. And therefore, you are, of course, the most foolish of all men. You are the most irrational of men, and yet you are divine because you are connected with the magnet, and you have this magnificent power of connecting your audience with your magnet. Now, the whole point here is what? That the artist is divine, and yet the artist is bad. And in the Phaedrus, Plato describes all the different types of madnesses there are, including the madness of the poet. And the point is that if you want to look for, for more moral life, you must go, Plato would say, to the philosopher. Or we might say, depending on the outcome of these lectures, to the teacher of history. Or, to, depending upon your decision regarding the variety of lectures, to the teacher of history and Marx would say, to the lessons of history. Or we might go to the teacher of religion, and the religious teacher would say, go to Sinai, or to the teacher of religion. Or we might say, to the lessons of experimental science. Or we might say, to the philosophical analysis of values. But Plato, at any rate, would say, but never to the artist. He's always disruptive of values. He is incapable of the rational organization of society. And therefore, when he came to organize a just society and to define justice, part B, he banished Homer. Part B, he censored Homer. He banished the poets. He banished most of the types of music. Well, so much for the first thesis, which actually merged or can merge into the second. The thesis that art is contradictory in some very deep and profound sense, which we can hint at but can't explore with morality. It's connected with the spontaneity or the Dionysiac quality of art. It's connected with the uh, qualities in Nietzsche of what go into being an artist. It's antisocial qualities. It's connected with this thesis of the artist being mindless. Perhaps it's all a mistake. Perhaps it's just true of art in a society which can't appreciate the artist. Perhaps it's true of art in a society which has a breakdown of its moral codes. At any rate, there are other possibilities. Let's look at them. Second possibility is that we are uh, discussing an issue which shouldn't arise. Art and morality are autonomous. They have nothing to do with each other. They could live in isolated compartments very effectively, very uh, well. There's no inherent contradiction. And there's no necessary compatibility or uh, servant-master relationship in either direction. What is the case, after all? The artist is concerned in the last analysis with certain plastic uh, 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 materials which he shapes according to experience, according to expressiveness, according to order. He is concerned with uh, certain organization of his environment in certain ways which he shapes according to what is pleasing or harmonious or fitting or expressive. He is concerned with uh, uh, sights and sounds and their recapturing or their restructuring or he's concerned with developing for himself a certain human style of expression and there is nothing in this, nothing in this, which should in any way affect, for better or for worse, issues regarding the treatment of bad to bad, issues regarding choices in life which lead to justice or injustice. It, there is simply a total isolation. The problem only arises because somehow we confuse it. We say art is a good, moral experience is a good, 
all goods must somehow be of the same kind and we demand of the artist that he somehow do something for the sake of morality or we demand of morality that it somehow be aesthetically harmonious instead of recognizing that there are different phases in the life of man, different phases in the life of reason and one has nothing to do with the other. That human being qua maker, qua homo faber, qua artist, human being qua moral structural structurer of his environment are different roles which could be totally disconnected. And of course there's a great deal of evidence for this thesis. A great deal of evidence in the sense that arts so often are neutral regarding their moral outcome. Uh, it used to be a Marxist thesis, for example, that art expressed the social aspirations and social consciousness of the society. And then one knows, for example, that the song of the uh, that the song which was interpreted as expressing, let's say, socialist aspirations, a Labour Party song, could also have been a Christmas hymn. And the beauty of the melody was totally independent to its social function. There have been a variety of attempts to suggest that art expresses a certain type of social consciousness. And yet, artists who have been notoriously reactionary have been uh, uh, considered uh, wonderful expressions of human values and artists who have been notoriously revolutionary, what have you, have also expressed human values or certain plastic values. And the whole question of the relationship between art and morality seems to be in a, in a total confusion, something which is exploited by propagandists. Let's give an illustration. Picasso was very concerned with expressing his own uh, bitterness during the Spanish Civil War. He was always concerned with painting bulls. He'd done it for years and years and years. It's a natural expression to paint bulls, to express bitterness and so on. And then, of course, he painted in the Guernica, which is a human response to human situation, which could have been a great painting if it had been on the Franco side instead of on the Loyalist side. He painted this bull. And people said, is this the symbol of Franco? And at first he said no. And then he said, yes, it is. And because he's a member of the Communist Party, I think, and he accepted the orthodox interpretation. The bull stands for Franco, and the art somehow has a moral function. But the plain truth is, of course, that uh, based on the evidence in this case, that the function of the bull was a different function in terms of expression of Picasso's personality and in terms of the, of the uh, 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 rendering of the theme which, with which he had always been interested in drawing for years and years and years. Well, you might say, but the very fact of expression is itself a value which makes it a morality. But the truth is, of course, that some expressions are moral and some expressions may be vile. And one cannot say that expression per se is a moral value. Some expressions may not. The question of morality would perhaps deal with the sponsors of the work of art, the influence of the work of art, the uh, consequences of the work of art, but perhaps be indifferent to the character of the work of art itself. And the artistic values would have nothing to do with moral values. I don't know why. It seems to me that if one made a cold appraisal of arguments, this position would probably be uh, the strongest. And yet it's one which I think would have the least acceptance. Because it seems to me people insist that art must somehow be connected with morality in one of two ways. The most important way they would sometimes maintain is that the last analysis, artistic values are secondary to human values. And art functions as an expression of human value precisely because it allows or it is a medium for the assertion of one whole domain of human values and points toward an ultimate sort of morality for man. So, for example, one finds what? A man like Berenson, who was so concerned, after all, with simply the identification of Renaissance paintings on basis of style and technique, saying that the last analysis, all art must be life-enhancing. Well, was Genet's art life-enhancing? Or Henry Miller, Tropic of Capricorn, recognized as a work of art, life-enhancing? Or many, many other things, life-enhancing? And one can think of great art uh, done for a variety of social causes which are despicable. Are they life-enhancing? One thinks Fuchtwang wrote a novel, Jud Sus, uh, Juice Sus, which isn't supposed to be, which I've read, I mean, after all, it isn't that great a novel, it's a mediumly good novel. Harlan Veit, German's great filmmaker, made a movie of Jud Sus, which is supposed to be a classic. It's never seen. There have been several attempts to have it shown, always rejected by the uh, censorship. Never seen. 
Why? Because he took the Fuchtwagen novel about a court Jew and made of it the most violent anti-Semitic movie, which is one of the classics of film art. It was the movie shown to indoctrinate SS troops. Would one say that Harlan Veidt's movie is a bad movie because it indoctrinated SS troops who were being sent to extermination duty? After all, to the great credit, even of the SS, that the suicide rate was so high among people on these camps that you had to have such special programs. Uh, uh, but but uh, it's an ironic sort of credit. It's credit to those who committed suicide, not to those who, who stated the work. But what is one to say here? Well, somehow you would say, but the ultimate or the last analysis of the work of art, which is life enhancing, is the great work of art because there's a continuity between all sorts of human values and artistic values are in a continuum with other values. And works of art which express bestiality or discrimination or hatred cannot be good works of art. And yet our human experience with any attempt to somehow legislate, find the bed in which there are artistic values which are subservient to human values in the 20th century has not been a happy one. Tolstoy might have written of the fact that art which doesn't preach love is not great art. But we know that the variety of attempts to make art subservient or expressive morality in the 20th century have by and large been failures. Think, of course, the most dramatic failure, the attempt within Marxism to say that all art must serve the social aspirations of brotherhood or the end of alienation. And what's the result? The result is you presumably can't have abstract painting except as decoration because it doesn't express the nature of man. And what do you end up with? You end up with glorified pink-cheeked figures, or you end up with dramatic portraits of Stalin. You say this is an abuse, but even in movements which aren't open to that abuse, even in any type of movement which tries to express uh, that art should try in some sense to express human values, the record of the 20th century has been that this has been censorship upon artistic creativity to a degree which does not allow for expression of artistic values. Whether it's the case of claims that art should express the self-consciousness of a, of a society, or whether it's other attempts, other attempts, religious attempts usually, either religion or uh, a socialism, or in some cases public government art, to see to it that art should express human values. By and large, the art written to express human values has, I think, not been a success. You might say this doesn't prove the point, and I agree that it doesn't. You might say it simply proves an old, old adage that to him, that in order to go, that to if you strive for something in order to achieve it, you won't achieve it. But if you strive for it, um, uh, for the thing itself, you might achieve it. In other words, if you strive for artistic values, you will achieve human values. But if you strive for artistic values in order to achieve human values, you will achieve neither artistic values nor human values. There may be such a paradox in creativity, some such sort of myth whereby it's only by pushing water through the sieve for love of the work that you finally discover the uh, ring. Perhaps that's true. But at any rate, it seems to suggest that those theories which have suggested that somehow through art, man will arrive at moral values have failed to recognize the way in which artistic values are, if not antithetical to moral values, at any rate, independent of them. There remains, and because this is a lecture on morality, the most interesting, to me extreme, hypothesis, and that is that artistic, analysis, artistic values in the last analysis the ultimate values, and that moral values are um, uh, expressive of them. I think the best way I could make this case, there are a number of ways of making it, I'll make it in one limited way, is to try to suggest what morality is in a certain way. Sometimes morality is the organization, as I said, of practical life. Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics suggests that the good is that at which things aim, and then man, being an animal of certain types, can either do things excessively or do things deficiently. I'll repeat this since it's a great deal of material. The good in morality is trying to achieve certain ends. Then for man or for human society, it's trying to achieve certain ends for human society. Usually the most general name for those ends is happiness. The ultimate moral life is an attempt to achieve a certain type of happiness. But then he'll say something like this. Then consider man as an animal that has appetites. 
he can, has to, let's say, eat. He can either eat deficiently or he can eat excessively or he can eat in accordance with the mean, in a certain moral manner. And this is, of course, morality, not to be a chazer, not to be a, um, a uh, pig, nor to be a finicky a seat, but to do the appropriate and right thing uh, in every context. And this is, of course, true for man's, not only man's animal nature, but for his appetitive nature faced with an issue of cowardice or rashness, to be courage, courageous. And moral life is that expression of moderation, of organization, for man as an animal, for man as an appetitive animal, even for man as a rational animal, faced with certain political problems, neither excess nor deficiency. I don't want to uh, go into competition with the President's inauguration speech, but the whole problem of the moral life being a problem of a vision of moderate organization of human experience through the mediation of conflict. But then one asks the question, and is this the end of life? Is this the ultimate fact? Is there some sense in which you will say, yes, it is. Think of the ultimate visions, the lion lying down with the lamb, peace, or happiness, or the rabbinic one, ishtachet gafno, ishtachet tenato, man under his fig tree, man under his vine tree, no one claiming what isn't his, no wars, all of those things which are, I think, the ultimate of morality, of moral vision. If there are conflicts, they're mediated with justice at the gates. You can find the biblical phrases of morality. Justice you shall pursue. And what does justice mean? I suppose a certain fairness, each man getting his share. The widows and the orphans won't be exploited, and so on. All right, let's assume all of that comes. Then there's still a claim, is this the ultimate in human aspiration, ultimate in human excellence? One might very well at this point say, that's enough for me, you know, that's, that's fine. But, but there's a certain spirit in man, call it ubris, as the Greeks did, a certain desire to transcend, which says, not just utopia, if by utopia you mean, you see, not, there is no utopia, but not just utopia, if by utopia you mean every man under his vine tree, justice in the gates, there'll be no widows and no ha harmful orphans, there'll be enough food for everyone to eat, and... Uh, so on and so forth. There is something else. And then the something else you say is, there is something in man which requires expression, either in rational scientific thought, which, which would be a certain sort of contemplation of truth, or simply an attempt somehow to express himself over and above any of these social relations, over and above any of these problems of mine and thine, rich and poor, uh, uh, the good roads or the bad roads, over and above safety, war, whether there's peace and health and happiness and all the moral virtues, there still is an attempt. And the quality of life, as the president says, is very good in the sense of the things he's talking about. There still would be an attempt to say, and man must express that element in him which is more than human, which is in some sense an element in him which he doesn't share with the other animals or perhaps, at any rate, no significant sense an attempt somehow to express himself with a certain authenticity or a certain style or a certain self-transcendence in terms of the environment around him, whether through voice or through sound or through plastic media or through uh, any medium that's possible. In doing that, man is man qua artist. And since it's the expression of what man is in the most ultimate sense, it's the expression of man's most highest values. And if morality is man's most highest values, in that sense, all the rest is just the framework in order to achieve the artistic experience. It's one of the presidents, I think it was Adams, who said, we must be states, we must be businessmen, I think he said, so that our children can be statesmen, so that their children will be philosophers, so that their children will be artists. And the point he was after is that the whole, that the whole fabric of social life and even ultimately of moral life is simply a uh, uh, corridor toward the achievement of this type of transcendence. And people who have been totally involved in artistic experience, of course, feel this way and suggest that this is true. And yet, to say this is to say, remember, that the artist does not have the responsibility in his art to achieve these ultimate moral values, and he could be indifferent to them. And this, of course, is a dumb, something which most of us pragmatically wish to reject. Well, I'm not trying to mediate this conflict, to sort of be an arbiter. I've suggested a claim for 
the four alternatives I've discussed. The four alternatives being to repeat that there is something innately contradictory between the spirit of art and the uh, uh, life of morality. And this contradiction is inevitable, will always arise. And I've given certain evidence for it. That there is something totally divorced about the two. That the, they simply reflect different aspects of the human temperament, different goals of human society. And it's a mistake to ever try to impinge one upon the other. Uh, the abstract paintings that David Rockefeller buys for the Chase Manhattan Bank should have nothing to do with the banking, either one way or the other. They shouldn't upset its bookkeeping. They should make it more liberal or more conservative. Thirdly, of course, the suggestion that, that the art should, in some sense, assist morality. In the last analysis, human values are transcendent, and the role of art is to somehow help the expression of those values to point to them. The role of a Gothic cathedral is to point to ultimate religious truth. The role of uh, uh, artistic symbol is to point to what, to use the phrase of the 17th century poet, to point to the God in nature, not to rest in nature. And then there is, of course, finally the position which says that on the contrary, the whole point of achievement of moral life, the whole point of achievement of moral goals is simply to create that minimal balance of tensions in the human organism to allow it to achieve the sort of ultimate transcendence which it is achieves only in artistic world. So that one ignores totally on this view the fact, well, whatever may have happened in the human experience, men have killed and so on and so forth, you judge the quality of a civilization, the last analysis, not by how happy the people were, but by what are its transcendent artworks. In that sense, art is the source of ultimate values, even when all the rest perishes. T.S. Eliot, for example, expressed this in which he says, civilization would be a pleasant, harmonious, moral civilization, but its monument would be a million lost golf balls and a hundred thousand roads. He was talking, of course, of American culture. And somehow he insisted the human experience wanted something more than this. For himself, of course, this ultimate something more, as a converted Catholic, was religion, but a converted Anglo-Catholic. But the, but the uh, ultimate source, the ultimate source for many, many people has been the artistic experience as that which, which makes civilization something more than at its best, a harmonious society in which people can achieve, what did I say, a million lost golf balls showing certain quality of life and 100,000 highways and all the rest of it. Well, I've simply, at the risk of going over my time, presented not four minutes, but I guess it was closer to 10 on each of these alternatives. I won't say any more about trying to resolve, decide among them. I'll leave it open for questions and comments. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. I'm sorry, I point this lady, I'll get you next, please. Well, I, I agree with your point, and now let's just see what the situation is. I think many cases you're right, probably in most cases. Uh, Dostoevsky has a figure in, an, in a novel called The Underground Man, who's supposed to be underground in London, <laughs> pardon me, supposed to be underground in London. During one of the World's Fairs there, I've forgotten which World's Fair it is, it's a fair at which the Victorian Crystal Palace was built. It's one of the early World's Fairs, I think four years before the Eiffel Tower one. That Crystal Palace is still there in Kew, and it's very lovely, and glass palace, the technology that could start building in glass and do this. And he has the man there fulminating against civilization, and he's really fulminating against the Victorian morality, and he feels they count up the pleasures and count up the pains, and he's arguing for a different sort of morality. 
And he expresses this way, I say two and two are five. You know, I've, the whole point is I'm willing to be anti-rational in that sense. There are other cases. Baudelaire argues, of course, against what would be called bourgeois morality or Flaubert. And usually, you're perfectly right, the critique of the artist against conventional morality is presumably in the name of another moral standard. Mann writes of this as the conflict of bourgeois and bohemian. And there are moral standards, but different moral standards. Indeed, in one sense of morality, every, every expression is a morality, and therefore the conflict has to be between different moralities. But I think there's a difference. I think there's a difference between a system which says, I am for these and these values, and in the name of these and these values, I am opposing the morality of the society which often is the case. Ibsen's an enemy of the society, is this case and so on. And one which says, I am for nothing. I really am for nothing. And in that sense, I'm opposing you simply because I believe art should be. Art at its best, ultimately, cannot be structured. So for example, if Burroughs, and this is the phenomenon we're talking about, says, how do you construct works of art? And he's serious, or as serious as he can be, and he says, I write it down on a typewriter, I fold it over, I fold it in four, I then cut it up and I put the pages apart. And this is my art because it's expression. And you say, what values? Art is anti-value. I don't know whether you would say, if you ask Genet on Sartre's interpretation, oh, I see Genet is a thief. Is he that against honesty? Is it the morality of the thief against the hypocrisy of the honest man? Anatole France wrote on this, you know. Uh, justice means that the poor man and the rich man both can't sleep on the park bench. In that sense, I'm against the morality because I believe that thievery is right. Proudhon said property is theft, therefore stealing property is righteousness. That's an anti-morality. But Jude isn't there. He doesn't believe in thievery as a principle. He believes in no principles. And what I was talking about in terms of the conflict is the sense in which the life of spontaneity and the life of unprincipledness in some sense is ultimately connected with the life of art. So it's not my morality versus your morality, though that itself would be an interesting question. It's, so to speak, the claim of anti-morality. This becomes difficult. What would to say, if, if the real prophet of his view is Nietzsche should be on good and evil. That I want to end the issues of morality, but isn't he championing a different kind of morality? Well, but at any rate, it's such a radically different kind, it's not just I criticize your values in the name of these explicit set of values. I'm against I'm against destruction of values for spontaneity and what I would call none values. Perhaps we can come back if you want to respond. Let me get this bad first. Yes. Outside of the social life, there are no morals at all. A man who lives alone on an island, quite alone, is neither good nor bad and doesn't need it. Different is the point of view of an artist. He has nothing to do with it. The suspicion against the artist and all those moral, all those moral certainty because he creates like sicko devils, not sicko from morals. And so he's outside of the moral. And if an artist is a moralist, this is uh, as Einstein, for instance, <coughs> the science being a physicist, writes about philosophy, and this is not his most important term. Yes. Well, I certainly think the first distinction is true. There is a sense in which morality, it seems to me, is inevitably social, political. Man is a social animal. To live alone would be a beast or a god. And in that sense, uh, to think of a man having morality, Whitehead's definition, uh, religion is what man does with his aloneness. In that sense, morality could never be what man does with his aloneness. If he's totally alone, I agree with you completely. There would be no moral question. You might say, what about his duty to himself or so on? But if man were totally alone, there would hardly be a moral question. Now, in that sense, the interesting question is, is art different in that sense? So that art really is what man does with his aloneness or in a totally asocial environment. Such, at any rate, is the theory among, I think, so many painters, for example, abstract expressionism, the dominant artwork. And yet, one wonders if this has been the theory of art at its best. And this is the, what must give pause. Because if we think of arts like architecture, it's not true. You can't think of good architecture except in the social milieu. And I wonder how much one would want to press this. I wonder how much one would want to say, isn't it the case that artistic experience involves either an ingestion of community values, 
the going to aloneness, the coming back to social, so that if somehow art isn't connected with expression of the moral values of the society, it fails. So it isn't just like the artist is an artist. If he's also a good moral human being, so much the better. If he isn't, that's too bad. But I wonder if the connection is in some subtle way not more intimate. I know this is just a question of backs and forths, but if you think of the novel, if you think of the novel, I don't think one could create a novel that wouldn't in some sense be a novel which would express values, have a point of view, be either a, a social morality or a criticism of social morality. If we think of abstract painting, that doesn't seem to be true, but I wonder if, if that's not a mistake, if the abstract painting is not also expression of certain community point of view. Still, I wonder, we're perhaps more off on the question of individuality and social and responsibility of the artist rather than uh, other ways in which this question could be put. Uh, one way would be uh, uh, simply stating it at least and agreeing with you, it certainly makes sense for me to say that something could have great artistic value and have indifferent or negative moral value. And the fact that this is true shows something, not necessarily about the inevitable conflict, but shows something about the relationship of art and morals, which makes it an autonomous source of what we call ultimate value. Is there time for one more question? I think so. Just one more. If there is one more. Yes. <coughs> No, I did try to answer in the last part. I did try to suggest the, the third and fourth. Uh, I tried to suggest the, the case of the vice versa was the, was the uh, let me just repeat part. Perhaps I didn't make it clear. The case of art functioning as the servant in a, in a value system, it seems to be is a case where a person says something like this. Art is a human activity. Art in the last analysis is social activity. All artistic experience is an attempt of taking certain cues that come from one's environment, reorganizing, restructuring them. One does this as a social man. In retrospect, we see that because the Greeks did geometry, their architecture was a certain type, their painting was a certain type, that because the medievals had a certain type of religious belief, a certain type of hierarchical society, their architecture and music was a different sort. The artist is always enmeshed with his society, and his contribution is to give expression to part of the values of the society. But those values will ultimately reflect the quality of the human relationships between men or among men. And therefore, the artist's function is somehow to symbolize some segment of the human relations. That can be critical. It doesn't have to be glorificatory. It can be critical of the bad aspects of human relationships and the culture around them. But the last analysis, since art is this sort of human experience, the values that the artist will do are a fabric of, of human values which are continuous with moral values where morality means the social relationships and social expression of that. So in that sense, the Gothic cathedral is not judged simply by its textural value, but by what it expresses in the last analysis about human nature or about human aspiration. So a Rembrandt drawing, think of the Rembrandt drawings of the Bible. People like them because they tell stories. But at the bottom, always, there are these very, if you just isolate the parts, very abstract uh, 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 work. And yet you say the value of the Rembrandt is not the fabulously abstract technique in the, uh, what is it, 17th century. The value of the work is always what it expresses about human values, what it expresses about social relations. And therefore, art, the last analysis, always is judged as an instrument of social expressiveness and therefore as part of the continuity of morals. If then, if then art fails to express or distorts or fails to enhance values or distorts values in long-term sense, then that art will somehow fail as art, since art is subservient in that sense to human values. That's one point of view. Contrary-wise, I gave this long exposition. What if you achieved utopia? What if, in that sense, morality, as we can conceive of it in social context, were somehow ideal and fixed? So that if you think of all the great moral dilemmas, war and peace, fairness between man and man, economic immoralities, all of these were solved, somehow you'd say, well, then what would man be? A contented rational animal, a morally organized experience, 
The ad colony is probably a morally just society, everybody fulfilling his function, nobody being exploited, all the rest of it. What more do you want? The answer usually is some type of human expression that makes man more than just a moral animal. And one of the dimensions has been art. And this, it's alleged, is totally autonomous, because, not because it's indifferent, but because it transcends the moral domain. The moral domain is simply the creation of an environment in which this type of human expression can exist and can continue. In that sense, people say, what marks a civilization is, in the last analysis, not its, its morality, interesting as that may be, but ultimately what it aspires to and those artworks in which its self-transcendence, that aspiration of itself in which it comes to terms with itself, has actually been embodied. And uh, that's, of course, the fourth and interesting point of view. And it's the point of view which one who looked for art as ultimate values, I think, would take of the four views I've mentioned, but, uh, or might take. But which is true? Which of these four views that we've discussed is the true one? Uh, that is another question, isn't it? Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.